Good morning to the Saints of Waitara and to those around the world. My pleasure to be here today to present a very important topic called How Long Does It Take to Be Saved? The Bible was read to us earlier very well, but I want you to notice these three verses again. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And Romans 5 verse 9 Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Bible critics love these three verses. They go on to ask, how can you say that the Bible is an inspired book when in one place the writer Paul says you have been saved, in another place he says you are being saved and in another place you shall be saved. These Bible critics then say that either Paul was having a bad day or the Bible is simply full of contradictions and therefore the Bible cannot be trusted and cannot be inspired. What is the answer to this dilemma? Let me hasten to say that Paul was not having a bad day. He knew exactly what he was writing about, as we shall see. Notice the tense of the words that Paul used. You have the past tense, the present tense, and the future tense. This is because there are three things that we need to be saved from not just one thing. And the three things are as follows. We need to be saved from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. Three different aspects of the salvation process. These three aspects have theological names. Justification, sanctification, glorification. But without the acceptance of Jesus as mankind's only saviour from sin, the one who came to save humanity from eternal death, our lives are ultimately without hope. Let me illustrate. Using the analogy of a shipwreck, we are out at sea and our boat has sunk. We are desperate to be saved and suddenly a lifeboat appears and we're told to get aboard and be saved. Justification is us getting into the lifeboat provided for us by Jesus. We do that, and logic confirms that we were justified in doing that, for that was our only chance of being saved. But the lifeboat still has to get us to the shore, and apart from some oars, there's no other way of propelling the boat to the shore. Sanctification is us pulling on the oars to get to the shore. Jesus is the pilot who owns the boat called Salvation and he knows the way and how to get us to our destination. Whilst Jesus pilots the boat, he has us pulling on the oars so that we remain focused not on life's problems but on getting to our destination. The power to do this comes from God but the will to do this must come from us. And this combination will provide Bible sanctification. And it is in the sanctification stage that our next Bible verse applies in Philippians 2 verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Commenting on this verse, an inspired Bible commentator states as follows, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 486 and 487, herein is revealed the outworking of the divine principle of cooperation without which no true success can be attained. Human effort avails nothing without divine power, and without human endeavour, divine effort is with many of no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must act our part. His grace is given to work in us, to will and to do 
but never as a substitute for our effort. The third component of the salvation process is called glorification, and this word simply means we have arrived at our destination, and that destination is heaven. Coming back now to the process of being saved from the penalty of sin or justification, another term for justification is imputed righteousness. This happens when we personally accept as our ransom the death of Jesus Christ as our personal saviour. For only the blood of the innocent substitute Jesus Christ will pardon us from the penalty of sin. Imputed righteousness at the justification stage is simply means that Christ's personal and perfect righteousness is credited to our account in the books of heaven. This is because our own righteousness is not good enough, for it is tainted with sin. Therefore we need to accept Christ's great sacrifice with gratitude. Yet we have people saying to themselves, I am a good person and therefore I'll be going to heaven, but they overlook a very important point. The Bible says in Romans 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, every human being needs the plan of salvation so freely offered by God. Which begs the next question. Why would anybody turn down the chance to be saved from sin and the end of this world when they could choose to be saved and therefore live forever in a perfect universe? Whilst Christ's perfect blood and perfect righteousness saves us at all times, there are two things that Christ's perfect sacrifice and perfect righteousness will not cover. Unrepented sins and spiritual neglect. But Christ does cover the earnest seeker of salvation when they are living up to the light that they have received. Now another term for sanctification is imparted righteousness. This happens when we allow Jesus Christ to write his law and his character on our hearts over our lifetime. It is called in the Bible having on the wedding robe of Christ's own perfect righteousness. And when God does this, then our love response will be that we will want to obey God's law. And when we reach that stage in our walk with God, we will be able to say, as is recorded in Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. The power to obey comes from God, but the will to obey must come from us. He will not force himself or his character upon us. So providing the wedding robe of Christ's own righteousness through the justification and sanctification stage is God's work. Wearing that robe is our job. And this essential part of the salvation process allows God to restore in us his image and reflect his character again. Then he can come back the second time to take us to the heavenly mansions that he is preparing for the saints. So having on the wedding robe of Christ's own righteousness through the sanctification process gives us a fitness for heaven. And God would want that. Because if we're going to be living with a holy God and holy angels for eternity, we need to be in harmony with them as our next Bible reading shows, Amos 3 verse 3, can two walk together except they be agreed. And here's some more good news. In the judgment, God judges a person by what they do with what they know. He couldn't be fairer than that, could he? And he also notices the opportunities he gave us to learn about how to be saved and yet chose to ignore the chance to learn, thinking that by being ignorant, 
we might just slide into heaven on a banana skin. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. God won't be mocked, nor will he make a mistake in that area either. Do note that there is a huge battle going on for the hearts and minds of us humans, and the two supernatural beings that are involved are the Creator God, who is the author of all that is good, and a perfectly created being called Lucifer, who turned himself into a devil, and who is the author of all that is bad. And by making correct choices, we actually decide our own destiny beyond the grave. The plan of salvation was predestined by God, but not the human's response to that plan. That is in our hands. After all, we were not made robots. For true love to exist, there must always be the freedom to choose. And God gave us that choice as a precious gift. Therefore, if God does the saving and we do the choosing, then this is not the time to sit on the fence as if there is some value in being neutral. We're not to be neutral. For Jesus, speaking as God, said in Luke 11 verse 23, He that is not with me is against me. So what we need is a knowledge of the Bible so that we can make intelligent decisions. And we get that knowledge by doing topical Bible studies. And it will all be worth it too. For there's a beautiful new world coming for the saved ones where there'll be no more sickness, suffering, pain or death. No more funeral parlours, hospitals or jails. These beautiful Bible promises also answer mankind's most basic question. What is the purpose of life? Well, the purpose of life is to grab the opportunity to become citizens of God's second kingdom of glory that is coming, and many in the world don't know this. And this sermon will help the sincere person who wants to know how to be sure of a place there, and we will be reunited with our loved ones if they have accepted the same invitation. So what peace and security there will be and freedom from want and fear, and sorrow will be a thing of the past, once we have been glorified. Another term for glorification is completed righteousness. This happens just before the greatest event the world will ever see occurs, and that is the second coming of the real Jesus Christ, which occurs after the counterfeit coming. So this is when we become victors in the battle between good and evil and between God and the devil. Thus in the eyes of the unfallen angels in heaven, the saved ones are the wise ones, but the ungodly and the unsaved ones are deemed by those who've received eternal life as being the unwise ones. So a major discovery has been made. The plan of salvation designed by God before sin ever entered the world envisages a complete restoration of man back into the image of God as originally Adam was made. For Revelation 22 verse 11 tells us that God will have a holy people on this planet earth before Jesus returns. Here it is. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. So once the unfallen angels in heaven see that the saints on earth have been made holy by God, then they also have the assurance that sin will not appear a second time ever again. And to God, so God has books in heaven for the benefit of his holy created beings. For he doesn't need books for himself, due to him knowing all things. Here are some of the books that the Bible tells us about. Exodus 32 verse 33, God has the names of all who claim to belong to him in a book in heaven. Daniel 7 verse 10, the book of judgment. Malachi 3 verse 16, the book of remembrance. Revelation 17 verse 8, the book of life. 
So now that we realize that God has instituted a threefold plan of salvation, what aspect is affected by the three parts of salvation? Well, the Ephesians 2 verses 5 and 8 column is dealing with the record of sin in heaven, whereas the 1 Corinthians 1.18 column is concerned with whether we have on the robe of Christ's perfect righteousness here on planet earth. And the Romans 5 verse 9 column deals with the fact that the sinful nature that we were born with, that's when it's removed, thus leaving us with the divine nature that God gave us when we became born again Christians. And then our imperfect human bodies become changed instantly by God into perfect human bodies. Consider for a moment the change that happens to a caterpillar in its cocoon. Just when the caterpillar thought its life was over, it became a beautiful butterfly. Just so, if any of us find ourselves staring down the tunnel of death and thinking that our life is over, then providing we've joined God's first kingdom of grace here on earth before we die, we will be resurrected, not as a butterfly, for that would be reincarnation which God's Bible does not teach. Instead, we will be raised as a perfect, recognisable human being with all imperfections gone. And the sinful nature will be gone, as 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52 says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And the good news is that when we are glorified, we will still be able to recognize each other and our loved ones who make it there. So what is the significance of justification? When we come as we are and humble ourselves and repent of our sins, and he records the word pardon at that point against every one of our confessed sins. And this provides us with our spiritual passport to heaven, providing there are no unconfessed sins left. Now what is the significance of sanctification? This is the aspect of salvation where God changes our characters, which ensures that we have a spiritual visa or fitness for heaven, as our next slide reveals. Isaiah 61 verse 10. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. So the blood of Christ provides us with our spiritual passport to heaven, once we accept it. And the robe of Christ's righteousness, manifested in the life of the born-again Christian, provides us with our spiritual visa for entry into heaven. So the actions and behaviours of committed Christians should be quite different from the secular world around us. Speaking about Christ's righteousness and character, do notice this point from an inspired Bible commentator recorded in a book called Christ's Object Lessons, page 311. This robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character, and this character he offers to impart to us. By now, we should be noting that entry into God's third heaven called paradise cannot be attained by any human unless he or she has a personal spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. And how can we obtain that connection unless we take the opportunity to be taught the Bible topically? Many people read it devotionally, but very few know about the importance of studying it topically. What I'm trying to say is that entry into heaven is not automatic. We need to choose to go there and accept God's terms for getting there. So what is the significance of glorification? This is the third aspect of salvation where God sees that we're ready for taking to heaven. And therefore he comes and either resurrects us or translates us back to the third heaven at the second coming of Jesus. 
The Pharisees and the Sadducees never understood this threefold plan of salvation, and that is why they called for the crucifixion of Christ. They were looking for a coming king to overthrow the Romans and did not understand that he must first come as our ransom by dying on the cross at Calvary. And then secondly, to be our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, ministering his shed blood on behalf of sinners. And thirdly, only after that could he then come back as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And modern day Sunday keeping Christians also seem to fail to understand the threefold plan of salvation and the importance of having God's spiritual visa, which is obedience to God's Ten Commandments. And therefore they do not seem to know that the righteousness supplied by Christ is to become our righteousness in the daily activities of life. We will now see in our next three Bible verses how commandment keeping at the second stage of salvation called sanctification and not the first stage of salvation called justification is directly linked to how God perfects his love in his people. 1 John 2 verse 3 And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And verse 4 says He that says I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But here's the key point, verse 5 but whoever keeps his word, in him truly is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. So obedience to God's Ten Commandments in the second part of salvation called sanctification cannot be legalism when God himself says, this is how my love will be perfected in you. But is there a way that I could become a legalist? Yes. If you try obeying God and his law at the first stage of salvation called justification, but definitely not a legalist at the second stage of salvation called sanctification. At the sanctification stage it makes us into loyalists, not legalists. As Jesus said in John 8 verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So have nothing to do with cheap grace, which denies the sanctification process of salvation. And Paul also said in our next Bible reading these words in Ephesians 5 verses 6 and 7, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not you therefore partakers with them. And to those who teach a false gospel, whilst doing good works in the name of God and claiming to be God's children, notice what happens to them. Matthew 7 verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? Then Jesus said unto them in Matthew 7 verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Why would Jesus say to these Christians, I never knew you, depart from me? Why did God reject one group of Christians and yet accept other Christians? Well, the group there on the left, this group loved God and did good works, but they did not obey God. The result was that God had to reject them. But the other group, this group also uh, followed God and they were allowed to go to heaven. They loved him, did good works and they rendered obedience in harmony with the conditions for entry into God's kingdom in the third heaven. 
This obedience comes during the sanctification stage. But the disobedient ones refused to be obedient, believing they could be saved in their sins instead of being saved from their sins. And the giveaway statement they make is this one, I will be sinning until Jesus comes. Therefore, giving themselves a license to sin and thus deny the power of God to save them from their sins. Two examples will prove that it is possible to reject sinful temptations from the devil and at the same time prove that sin is an act of choice, not an act of birth, and therefore can be rejected by God's grace. Joseph, when tempted to commit adultery, showed that a person can say no to temptation instead of saying yes. Notice what uh, is said in Genesis 39 verse 9. Joseph is speaking and he says, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Jesus also proved the point that temptations can be resisted when we look at how he dealt with a woman caught in adultery. He said in John 8 verse 11 these words, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. So having choice stands to reason when we consider that it was bad choices that caused the war in heaven. You see, that war in heaven was over the very issue of obedience to God's law in heaven versus Satan's new plans to introduce a new idea that created beings could decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. And that's what's happening in the world today. People are deciding for themselves what is right and what is wrong and we have anarchy in many, many places as a result. But when Satan did this, God was left with no choice but to cast Lucifer, now called Satan, and his evil angels out of heaven for rejecting and disobeying God's perfect and objective law of love that governs his universe. Therefore, God is not going to let disobedient people back into heaven. That is why God does not accept the disobedient Christians. These Christians were indeed justified. After all, they had accepted Jesus as their saviour, but they never sought to be sanctified through obedience to God's commandments, mentioned in 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. As Matthew 22, 14 tells us, all people are called to God's first kingdom of grace, but few are chosen to be in God's second kingdom of glory, for it's only the obedient ones that go there. We know this because God had to kick out of his second kingdom of glory a third of the angels for disobedience. That is how we know that God won't let disobedient Christians who presumed upon God's mercy back into heaven. When I went to Zimbabwe in November 2012, I had my first experience of needing a literal visa attached to my literal passport. And in order to ensure that we can go to heaven at the second coming of Jesus Christ, we will need to recognise that we will need a spiritual visa attached to our spiritual passport. Now we need to see two very important points at this stage of the presentation. Jesus is our substitute and ransom for us being saved from the penalty of sin, and that is the first point. And when we accept him as our personal saviour, this becomes our spiritual passport to heaven, as I mentioned before. Christ imputes or credits his perfect character to our account at the time when we come just as we are to God repentantly for a pardon. And this is what the Ephesians vertical column is all about. But in the first Corinthians vertical column, Jesus is our example for how to be saved from the power of sin and that is the second point. He is not our substitute for sanctification. He is our example. To say he is our substitute here is to replace Christ's good theology with man's new but bad theology. For well, this is when Christ imparts that righteousness to us during our lifetime, which enables us to love him and keep his commandments, which provides us with a spiritual visa for heaven. 
Too many Christians today are being taught that Christ is our substitute for sanctification instead of being taught that Christ is our example. Thus they do nothing about becoming holy people or overcomers as God wants. This will happen when we allow the Holy Spirit to empower us. This is important, as we will see when we read our next Bible verse, Revelation 3 verse 5. He that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and his angels. So there is the evidence that overcoming sin is an essential part of being saved if we want to keep our names in God's book of life and be saved into God's second kingdom of glory. Therefore sanctification is not just a lovely way of saying to God, thank you for justifying me, as if joining God's first kingdom of grace was the only part of the salvation process. Our names can be blotted out from God's book of life if we don't allow God to sanctify us. When we do allow God to do this for us, it leads progressively to a changed and obedient and happier life because we have firm social boundaries. It prepares us to be compatible with a holy Godhead and the good and holy angels we seek to live with in heaven. The sanctifying process on God's part to make us holy prepares us to be citizens in God's second kingdom of glory. Therefore, if our names can be taken out of God's book of life, the doctrine called once saved, always saved, must be wrong. Now another important point needs to be well and truly noted. All Christians accept that God's love is unconditional, but unconditional love is not the same as unconditional approval. For God's plan of salvation has conditions. And the conditions of salvation are identical in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what are the conditions? Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 in the Old Testament. Now therefore if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. That is the first condition for the sanctification process. But it is only to happen after we have chosen to accept the sacrifice of Christ and become a disciple or follower of Christ. We then allow Christ's righteousness to become our righteousness through obedience to God's commandments. I stress that the conditions of the covenant are met during the sanctification process, not the justification stage. Here is the second condition, Exodus 20 verse 6, but showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That's conditional salvation. Here's the third condition for total salvation, but this time from the New Testament, Hebrews 8 verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. This goes on, it says, I will be to them a God and they shall be unto me a people. And the fourth condition also from the New Testament is Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And it's in the sanctification stage that God does the sanctifying and thereby makes us holy if we cooperate with him. As our next verse says, Leviticus 20 verse 8, I am the Lord who makes you holy. So if they miss out on eternal life by failing to make these right choices, then they will have no one to blame but themselves. They'll be destroyed eternally, and that is so sad. So now we come to the question we've been wanting to answer. How long does it take to be saved? Well, it only takes a moment to be saved from the penalty of sin. The moment we accept Jesus as our Saviour in a repentant and sincere way, as 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Well, how long does it take to be saved from the power of sin? The answer is that it takes a lifetime to be saved from the power of sin 
why a lifetime? Because Satan continues to tempt us to sin right up until we die. But here is some good counsel. Never become discouraged if we stumble in our walk with God or forget to do what he wants us to do. The battle for the hearts and minds of humans is concerned with loyalty towards or rebellion against the creator God of the universe. It's not concerned about the occasional stumble or fall, for the Bible says that the righteous ones will stumble, and that's recorded in Proverbs 24, verse 16. For a just man falls seven times and rises up again. But God will always be there to pick up and encourage the stumbling ones, and he'll do more than that, for he promises to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as 1 John 1 verse 9 says. So God is the one who'll help us become the person he wants us to be if we let him, so that heaven will be a safe place that we will love to be in. Finally, how long does it take to be saved from the presence of sin? It only takes a moment at the second coming, in the twinkling of an eye, as we read before in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52. So with this understanding that we need to be saved from three things, the penalty of sin, which is the work of a moment, the power of sin, which is the work of a lifetime, and the presence of sin, which only takes a moment, we now have the complete plan of salvation, a comprehensive plan that ensures that God is then able to get rid of sin, sickness, suffering, pain and death permanently. All evil things that Satan has inflicted on the people of the world so that God will get the blame. Now, are there any signs that would tell us that we have been, are being, and shall be saved from these three things? Yes, there are. The sign that tells us we're saved from the penalty of sin is baptism by immersion. Jesus is our example in this matter. Picture one is the stage where we've agreed to get into the water and be baptised as Jesus requires. Picture two has us going right under the water for about two seconds, symbolising death and burial to the old ways of life. Picture three and four symbolises resurrection to a new way of life. Sprinkling of water over a baby or an adult does not convey that message. Therefore, being baptised in the correct manner is very important. But it is very worthy to have a dedication service for a baby to have God's care and Christian upbringing, which is why we encourage Christian parents to dedicate themselves and their babies to God and keeping and his care at a special dedication service. But that is not baptism. Well now back to our chart. Is there a sign that we're being saved from the power of sin? The Bible says there is. It's the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath holy as God commanded. That is because the seventh day Sabbath commandment is the only commandment that contains the authority of God to give us his law. And it takes dedicated men and women to swim against the tide of current world opinion and religious traditions and practices. But that's what it takes in order to keep the seventh day holy. That God made holy back in the Garden of Eden 2,200 years before there was a Jew on planet Earth. For God said in Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 that this would be his sign that we are being sanctified and thus being saved from the power of sin. Let us read about that now. Ezekiel 20 verse 12. And I gave them my Sabbath days of rest as a sign between them and me. It was to remind them that I am the Lord who had set them apart to be holy. However, we don't put ourselves on a pedestal because we do this. Instead, it is God who has put all Seventh-day Sabbath keepers there. And when we obey God's Ten Commandments in the sanctification stage, something amazing happens. We read it before. What does it say? But whoso keeps his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. So God helping us to obey the Ten Commandment law 
is how God is perfecting his love in us, as this Bible verse said. And as a result, we will become very different and happier people. So don't let anybody tell you that if we obey God's Ten Commandments that we are a legalist. This verse tells us that we cannot possibly be a legalist if God is perfecting his love in us when we choose to obey his word. In fact, it means we are loyalists, as I mentioned before, not legalists. Jesus resting in the tomb on the seventh-day Sabbath also proves which day is the seventh-day Sabbath. Well, you, everybody knows that Christ died on Friday because we get Friday off every time there's an Easter service every year. Christ rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day, which is the Saturday, and then he rose from the tomb on the Sunday, as Luke says, for it was the first day of the week. And so the keeping of the seventh-day Sabbath of God is important to him, and as we grow in grace, it needs to become increasingly important to us. So important, in fact, that he wrote it onto the tables of stone called the Ten Commandments. And now he's writing those laws onto our hearts if we let him. By the way, they're not ten suggestions. They are ten commandments. Therefore, any Christian who refuses this sign is saying, I will accept Christ's shed blood as my spiritual passport to heaven, but I refuse to have the spiritual visa or to honour the sign of allegiance to God by keeping the seventh-day Sabbath sacred. They are therefore guilty of trying to go to heaven on their own terms instead of God's terms by refusing God's spiritual visa. Maybe they take this attitude because they've been told they'll become a legalist if they do that. But Jesus says in this verse, in John 14, verse 21, He that has my commandments and keeps them he it is that loves me, and he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Jesus says that those who keep his commandments are his friends. And of course, this is God's desire and expectation. After firstly accepting Christ's great sacrifice and being saved from the penalty of sin first. Now, Jesus says that those who keep his commandments are his friends. That's right, we've had that. And in Hebrews 4, 1 to 11, we have the evidence that New Testament Christians are to keep it as well. This may come as a surprise to many Sunday-keeping people, for despite what many a first-day Sunday-keeping priest or pastor or minister might tell us, this verse says we are to keep the fourth commandment of God. Sabbatismos, that's the Greek word for the Sabbath. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his, on the seventh day. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Hebrews 4, verses 9 to 11. And our next slide reveals that we're going to be keeping the seventh-day Sabbath in heaven. Isaiah 66 verse 22 gives us the context. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make, says the Lord, that's the context. In verse 23, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sunday to another. Is that what it says? No. From one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So we won't be keeping Sunday in heaven. So seventh-day Sabbath keeping from God's point of view enables him to identify those who truly love him. From mankind's point of view, our obedience to all ten commandments, including the seventh-day Sabbath commandment, is our response of love to God's requirement to obey him at the sanctification stage. But uh, just a word of warning to our Sunday-keeping Christian brothers and sisters, if you're living up to the light you've got, God will save you. This is new information for many of you, and God would have you consider it very seriously. Converted people will see God's requirement to obey not as a burden, but as a delightful response of principled love that obeys God because we accept that God knows best. This is the sign that we are being saved 
from the power of sin. Now is there a sign that we shall be saved from the presence of sin? Well, we're all lost if there isn't. Notice what the sign to say that we shall be saved from the presence of sin is. The resurrection and translation event at the second coming of Christ. So now we come to the final line on our chart, how long does it take to be saved? We've already mentioned that in the time factor it only takes a moment to be saved from the penalty of sin. The moment we accept Jesus' invitation to join his first kingdom of grace here on earth. But it takes a lifetime to be saved from the power of sin and the evidence that we're being saved from the power of sin is when we reach the stage in our walk with God where God's objective laws and his wishes for us become paramount in the way we think and act. Finally, it only takes a moment to be saved from the presence of sin at the last trump when Jesus returns. We're now going to do a summary vertically of the three Bible verses. Paul knew what he was talking about when he said in Ephesians 2 verses 5 and 8 that we have been saved from the penalty of sin. It's called justification. It's when Christ imputes his righteousness to those who accept him as their saviour. And the word pardon is placed against our sins in the records of heaven. Christ's shed innocent blood provides us with a passport to heaven. Therefore he is our substitute and baptism by immersion is the sign that we've accepted his great sacrifice and it only takes a moment, the moment we decide to become one of Christ's followers. In the second column, 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul talked about salvation in the present tense because he knew we needed to be saved from the power of sin. It's called sanctification, which is imparted righteousness this time. It provides us with a perfect character so that we can enjoy life in heaven. It provides us with a spiritual visa. Christ is our example for sanctification, and not our substitute. And the keeping of the seventh day Sabbath holy is the sign that we are being saved from that power of sin, but it takes a lifetime. Finally, in Romans 5 verse 9, Paul knew that there was a salvation process that involving the future, whereby we are to be saved from the presence of sin. It's called glorification or completed righteousness. Our sinful natures are then removed, the saints are ready for heaven, and the resurrection and translation event is what takes them there, and that only takes a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So now I'm going to cover the Ephesians 2 column. Why? Well, Jesus paid the supreme price in order to give mankind a second chance to have eternal life. His death at Calvary is written on the pages of history as a fact, and that Satan cannot change that. Now I'm also going to cover over the last column dealing with being saved from the presence of sin. Why? Because Jesus cannot lie. He said he would come back the second time, and Satan cannot stop it happening. He will try and to emulate it though, but he will be defeated. This only leaves the middle column for Satan to attack God's people. By trying to stop them from allowing God to perfect holy characters in them. This Satan is striving to do with all his might and it goes on throughout our lifetime. That is why our next Bible verse makes sense where it says in Luke 13 verse 24, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. No striving is needed in order to come to Jesus and seek a pardon at the first stage of salvation from the penalty of sin, which is called justification. It's in the second stage of salvation called sanctification, which saves us from the power of sin, that we are to strive to have our characters reflect the character of Jesus. This calls for endurance, as Luke 13 verse 24 stated. And Matthew 24 verse 13 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. But all the power we need in order to endure is available to us, as our next Bible verse states, Philippians 4 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But as you can now realise, there is more to being saved than meets the eye. But the seekers of truth, and also God's people, 
can be excused for feeling they are walking on a tight rope of confusion, trying to find the answers that give them meaning to life, but struggling because of the confusion that exists in the religious world. I shall now present some of the theological issues that trouble people, but always recognising the following. I will expose some of the errors that I am aware of, but not condemn the people who are unwittingly caught up in it. That is because God has his people in all churches. We'll start by looking only at the Judaic Christian theology, for this is the religion that God established himself. All other religions were created by mankind and not by God. The next few slides will help us determine if our theology is being moulded by God's word or if the theology is being moulded by false shepherds. So remember, we're not testing the people, we're testing the theology. The great error of the Jewish leaders was their rejection of Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. Apart from the Messianic Jews, they got that right whilst they were very earnest about keeping God's Ten Commandments. So for the Jews who've rejected Jesus Christ, they've only got 50% of their theology correct. But it's not only the Jewish leaders that have a theology problem. The leaders of the Sunday branch of Christianity have also created huge theological problems. I know, because I have been a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Roman Catholic, the great theological error of many current worldwide Christian leaders is the opposite. They fully accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah, but they reject God's Ten Commandments by saying they were nailed to the cross. So they got the first half of the spiritual equation right, so we'll give their theology a 50% pass mark also. But some branches of Christianity have created another problem. They fully accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah, but they teach that a Christian only needs to keep nine of God's Ten Commandments and ignore the Sabbath commandment. They got the first part right, didn't they? And they almost got it right with the second part. So should we give their theology a 90% pass mark? Sorry, we can only give them a 50% pass mark because of what the Apostle James says in our next Bible reading, James 2 verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one, he is guilty of all. I mentioned the Bible says a law was nailed to the cross, but it cannot be the law that James was referring to, can it? So let us see what was nailed to the cross. We'll read the bottom first. Ten Commandment law defines sin. All humans need this law which will then lead them to need a saviour when they realise they've broken that moral law. But before Christ came, the Old Testament people needed a different law. It's the Mosaic law, designed to show them how God would provide a saviour, typified by the slaying of an innocent spotless lamb. Thus it was the law of God a law of Moses, I'm sorry, contained in ordinances that was nailed to the cross, not God's moral Ten Commandments. And within those Ten Commandments, of course, you have the need to keep the seventh-day Sabbath. This is why Jesus said, The truth shall set you free, not error, for error will not save anybody. And that is why the Seventh-day Adventist Church is such an important Christian church, because it has the combination right. Thus, this church gets a 100% pass mark for its theology because we teach the correct definition of sin which is the breaking of any of the Ten Commandments of God and we teach that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah mentioned way back in the Old Testament times three and a half thousand years ago. Sin is mankind's problem. Christ is mankind's solution. So let me tell you about this marvellous Saviour, Jesus Christ, who will save us from our sins if we let him. The greatest man in history is Jesus. He had no servants, yet they called him Master. 
He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. And here's a beautiful promise that God gives to those who want to live with him. He said in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And what a future awaits the faithful saints, living in a free mansion made by none other than Jesus Christ. The choice is ours, and our eternal destiny hangs on the choices we make. So why not make that choice today to accept Jesus Christ as your personal saviour? He awaits your decision. And if you pray to God, the Holy Spirit, to help you understand the Bible, you will be starting on a very worthwhile journey to come close to God. May God bless us all today and always is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.